Good morning. Uh, before we start, I would like to just lift up a, a, a couple individuals. Little Zeke was in the hospital last night. He was unresponsive. And so his mother, Becky, took him in and uh, they released him, but they found out that both of them have the flu. So I just want to lift them up. And then also a quick recovery. Just want to keep Marianne in our prayer. So if you would, as a church, just please uh, pray with me. Father in heaven, we just come before you and we just thank you, Lord, that you are in control. I just pray for little Zeke that you just heal his body completely and quickly. We just pray for his mother that you give uh, her strength and that you heal both of them in the name of Jesus. Just allow them to have a quick recovery. And we also just pray for Marianne that you just continue in healing her up. And we just pray that you comfort her, Lord, that you're with her. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, as I found out after, uh, or actually during first service, this passage that we're going to go through, it has a lot of different names of either individuals or cities. And first service, I just had a mouth full of marbles. I could not pronounce <laughs> anything, and it was very difficult. So, I'm apologizing to you right now about how I'll probably stumble through these names. I just, part of it is because I can't see. I'm having a hard time seeing here, but then even if I see it correctly, I'm, but God's good, huh? For those here this morning, I want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. Maybe you're listening on our radio station or you're watching the live stream. Welcome. Welcome if you're here in this main sanctuary. Here at Calvary, we seek out the Lord. We want to go deeper in His Word, deeper in prayer. Why? So that we can go further out there as we go deeper. We want to spread the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that is what it is all about, Jesus. Here at Calvary, we read, we study the Bible, line upon line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book. Please turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 13. As I said, we just go verse by verse on Wednesday, we ended chapter 12, verse 25 was the last verse in, in chapter 12, so we're going to pick it up in a, in a minute here, a um, couple minutes here in, in chapter 13. Here in chapter 13, we enter into a different phase of the acts of the Holy Spirit. Bless you. The Christian church was now poised to take on the Great Commission. They had decided that it was time to deliberately take the gospel out to all the world, obeying Jesus' command in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which reads, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. It was a decision taken under the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit. You see, the men of the early church knew what was important. And it was not their will, but God's will. God's will. And now led by the Holy Spirit, it was time to have a systematic approach to spreading the gospel. Acts chapter 13 and 14 tell the story of the first missionary journey of Saul and Barnabas as they set out from Antioch. And concerning Antioch, the ancient world had a number of different cities named Antioch. Most of them were founded by the Greek ruler, Seleucus, the first who ruled from 305 to 281 B.C. He named the cities after his father. So here in chapter 13, two Antiochs are actually mentioned in this chapter. Verse 1 speaks of the city that Saul and Barnabas would depart from. And that is on, looking at the slide, the bottom right part of it. It's a little bit inland, Antioch. And also we have Antioch and Pisidia, which is up there uh, about middle high. Mentioned later in this chapter in verses 14 through 16, a city in which both Saul and Barnabas would also visit to preach the gospel of Jesus. The Antioch in, in verse 1, from which Saul and Barnabas would be sent from, it was about 15 miles from the coast. It was inland. So they actually had to walk the way from Antioch to the port of Seleucia. From there, they went across the Sea to Cyprus, where they preached at Salamis and Paphos. 
And then later they would sail from Paphos to Perga and to many other cities which we will cover as a church when they do come up in Scripture. This first journey took about three and a half years to complete. So let's pick it up in verse 1 of Acts chapter 13. (laughs) Here we go, Lord. Help me with the names. (laughs) Some days you have it and some days you just don't. (laughs) Uh, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manion, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Verse 3. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, verse 7, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear from the word of God. Verse 8. This one's a tough one. But Alumas, the sorcerer, it's where we get our word illuminate. The sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the pro council away from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Verse 10, and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Verse 11, And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Verse 12, Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching. Of the Lord. Father in heaven, I just pray that we are just astonished at your words this morning. I just ask by your Holy Spirit that you speak to each one of us what we need to hear, Lord. That they don't hear from me, but they hear directly from you, Lord. We just pray that your Holy Spirit falls afresh on us. In the name of your Son, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Verse 1, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manion, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So where it says certain prophets and teachers, prophets and teachers, they had different functions. The prophets were wandering preachers who had given their lives to listening for the word of God, and then taking that word to their fellow men. The teachers, they were men in the actual churches whose duty was to instruct new believers, new converts in the faith. The gift of prophecy commonly included the gift of teaching. The former implies a more direct message from God. The latter, a more systematic instruction of the word of God, both coming from the Holy Spirit. Here in verse 1, we have five men that are mentioned of the church. Barnabas, a Levite from Cyprus. He was a deacon in the church. A good man filled with the Holy Spirit, Scripture tells us. Simeon, called Niger. Niger means black, so presumably he was a black or olive skin believer among the congregation at Antioch. And possibly the Simeon who carried Jesus' cross. You can read about that in Luke chapter 3, verse 26. And if you think about it, that would be actually pretty cool. That if the man who first, whose first contact with Jesus was the carrying of Jesus' cross attached, which he, Simeon, must have bitterly resented at first, was one of the first to be directly responsible for sending out the story of that cross to the world. It's kind of cool to think about. 
In verse 1, we also have Lucius of Cyrene, one of the men of Cyrene. He was in the church at Antioch. Manion. This guy's interesting. The Manion mentioned here grew up, Scripture says, with Herod the Tetrarch, the king. This was the same Herod who beheaded John the Baptist and presided over one of Jesus' trials. You can read about that in Luke chapter 23. The word brought up is interesting because it means nursed with and as one. Also companion of childhood and youth. So some theologians actually debate that this could mean literally that this was the foster brother of Herod's son, Anaphas. So here we enter on a name, Manian, that has historical associations of some interest. Per Josephus, the Jewish historian in his book, The Antiquities of the Jews, he writes that in the early youth of Herod the Great, his future greatness had been foretold by an Essene prophet of the name of Menahem or Manian. When the prediction was fulfilled, Herod the Great sought to honor the prophet, the identity of name makes it probable that the man who is recorded here in verse 1 is the son or grandson of the Essene, the prophet, and that Herod had raised him up or brought him up with his own son in Rome as a mark of favor. And then here in verse 1, out of these five men last, but definitely not least, we have Saul. We have gone over Saul considerably, born in Tarsus and Cilicia, which is modern-day Turkey, of Benjamite lineage. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, one who adhered strictly to the law of Moses. He spoke Aramaic, Greek, Latin. He was a Roman citizen, star pupil of the respected rabbi in the Sanhedrin, Gamaliel. He studied to be a lawyer. He was on his way to becoming part of the Sanhedrin, which was Israel's supreme court. And Saul was a huge persecutor of the church, of the followers of Jesus, until, until Jesus got a hold of him on that road to Damascus and made himself known to Saul. And then Saul was converted, and then Saul dedicated the rest of his life to serving Jesus. It has been pointed out that this list of men here in verse 1 is symbolic of the universal appeal of the gospel and of all tribes and tongues of the church. You had Barnabas, a Jew from Cyprus. Lucius from Cyrene, which is Libya. Simeon, a Jew, presumably a black or olive skin African. Manian from Rome with royal connections. And Saul, a Jew from Turkey, Pharisee of Pharisees. In this little band of brothers is exemplified the unifying influence of Christianity. Men from many different lands and many different backgrounds who had discovered the secret of togetherness. You see, because they discovered the secret of Christ, the gospel of Christ, they discovered the love of Christ. The world says that Christians are bigots, that we are racist, that we are exclusive, we discriminate, that we as believers are hateful. That is so untrue. And it is ignorant. Ignorant means unaware unknowing, uneducated. In reality, the church is the most inclusive band of people there are. Look around you. We all come from different backgrounds, different areas. The true church of God is the most inclusive group that there can be. It doesn't discriminate on the basis of race, creed, color, National origin, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender expression, age, height, weight, physical or mental ability, 
doesn't discriminate because of financial stability or you have no money or veteran status or marital status. See, all of that, all of that, it doesn't matter. All that does matter to see the kingdom of heaven is that you believe in the name of Jesus. It's that simple. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins, that he arose, and now he is alive. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and then live your life accordingly. Obey his commands. Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. If you love me, obey my commands. It doesn't matter where you have come from. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter when you've come. It doesn't matter why you've come. All that matters is who is Jesus to you. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a lunatic? Is he a liar? For he said he was a son of God. He said that the only way to heaven is through him. Or perhaps, is he the Lord? Is he your Lord? See, this is the most important decision that you will ever make here on earth. For this decision, it will echo in eternity forever. God makes it so simple that all we have to do is keep all 613 rules and regulations in the no, no. He says, believe in the name of Jesus. Believe in my son. That if we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he died, but the grave couldn't hold him, and he arose, and now he's at the right hand of God. He is the son of God. It doesn't matter anything else. If you believe that, then you will have eternal salvation. You will see the kingdom of heaven. Who is Jesus to you? Verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Verse 3. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. The word minister there means to serve the public at one's own expense. It suggests the spiritual nature of their service. See, the elders at Antioch, they were not in it for the money, for the scratch. Theirs was a sacrificial service as well as a spiritual service. See, it costs them something to be elders. It always does. A person does not qualify to lead God's people unless he is prepared to make sacrifices in time, money, and effort. See, to serve Christ means to die to yourself. To die to yourself. Not everybody wants to do that. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Fasting isn't a command. But Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, when you fast, not if, but when, It suggests that fasting was a common practice. Fasting is often accompanied at the beginning of an important task or ministry. Same as today. Jesus, he fasted for 40 days before he was tempted in the wilderness and before he began his ministry. It takes effort. It takes commitment to fast. Fasts usually are abstaining from food, but too often 
The focus of fasting is on the lack of food rather or instead of the purpose of fasting, which should be to take our eyes off of the things of this world and to focus completely on the things of God. That's what fasting is about, spiritual devotion, seeking out God through prayer, waiting on him to hear from God. The thought is every time we think of food or we have a hunger pang, we use that time to pray and seek out God. These men here in chapter 13, they were men of fasting, men of spiritual devotion. They were seeking out God. And when they were seeking out God, when they were diligently seeking God, God answers. The Holy Spirit spoke to them. Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. I have called them. So the Holy Spirit had already been confirming the desire to Saul and Barnabas. You see, for no elder board can do more than confirm and endorse the work, the work that the Holy Spirit has already done in an individual's heart. The call to serve must come from God. It must come from the Holy Spirit. Not a man, not an elder board, not a church, but God. But God, he's the one that calls. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. This laying of hands did not conjure up a special gift of power and grace. See, Saul and Barnabas, they were already apostles. They were already Ministers, envoys, messengers of God. The laying on of hands was much what it was in the Old Testament when a, a Jew would bring his lamb to the priest for sacrifice. He was required to lay his hands or put his hands on that lamb, that sacrifice, in a symbolic act in which he identified himself with that lamb, with that sacrifice. It was the substitute for him. Just so these elders laid hands on these two men as their spirit-chosen substitutes to the regions beyond. You see, it was a mark of confidence and also one of fellowship. Verse 4. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. With the prayer meetings being over, the Holy Spirit sends this missionary team out. Not man, but the Holy Spirit. It is important to note this distinction. That it came directly from the Holy Spirit, from the authority of God. Why? Because you see, a work of man will eventually fail. But a work of God will accomplish its goals, which is always to glorify God. A work of man will eventually glorify that man, but a work of God will glorify God. So Saul and Barnabas, they are first sent to Seleucia to take a ship to the island of Cyprus with Mark tagging along. If you remember the last verse in Acts chapter 12, verse 25, it reads, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So you have Barnabas and Saul, then you have the young man, Mark. Barnabas, he was a native of the island of Cyprus, and it would be typical of his gracious heart that he should desire to share the treasures, the good news of Jesus, first with his own people. Now, Cyprus, it was a Roman province. It was famous for its copper mines and its shipbuilding industry. It was sometimes called Macaria, which means the happy isle. For it was thought to have the perfect climate and its resources so varied that a man might find everything that he would want or need on the island. Verse 5. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. So here we have two veterans and a rook, a rookie. And they start in Salamis. Now, Salamis, it was a thriving commercial center, contained a number of synagogues. 
It was the commercial capital of the island of Cyprus, with Paphos on the other end of the island, the political capital. The missionaries, they started a pattern that they would follow in all of their pioneering work. You see, in the synagogues, there was a custom called the open synagogue, which meant that any able Jewish man could speak or teach from the scriptures in the synagogue. Barnabas and Saul, they took advantage, full advantage of this custom to teach from the scrolls, the the, uh, Old Testament, the scriptures, to teach and preach about Jesus. By preaching Jesus in the synagogues, they spoke to those who had some knowledge already of God. They sought out people of their own kind first, but soon the rabbis in the synagogues would throw them out (laughs) because it was contrary to what the rabbis were teaching. See, the rabbis were all about the law, keeping the Mosaic law, those 613 plus laws. Bondage. And here comes Saul and Barnabas, and they're saying, no, man, just believe in Jesus, believe in the name of Jesus. So after a time, the rabbis would just throw them out. But we know per scripture that the word of God does not go out void. And some of those who heard, some who heard in the synagogues, they did believe. Verse 6. Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear The word of God. He sought to hear the word of God. The city of Paphos, it was political, pagan, and perverted. It was also the Roman seat on the island, and the proconsul there was Sergius Paulus. Literally, a proconsul was an official that acted on behalf of Rome in a certain area, they were governors with civil authority, but it also can include authority over a military post. And the governor of the island of Cyprus was Sergius Paulus. This actually is a picture of the dude. And he summoned Barnabas and Saul. He wanted to hear the word of God. He had heard of them, and he was interested in what they had to say. But these were still superstitious times. And most great men, even an intelligent man like Sergius, they kept private wizards or fortune tellers, sorcerers who dealt in magic and spells. Bar Jesus, he was a Jew, and he was one of these sorcerers to the proconsul. Verse 8. But Elu Moss, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Bar Jesus, or Alumas, again, it's where we get the, the English word illuminate. Arabic word. It means the skill or enlightened one. Bar Jesus, he was an apostate Jew. He had rejected the scriptures which forbade sorcery. This man, whose name was literally Son of God, set himself up like a mini Antichrist. And he had the governor under his spell. And Bar Jesus knew that if the governor, the proconsul, was won over to Christianity, that his day was done. His meal ticket punched, his cush job over. The word withstood, it means to stand against, to oppose, to resist. Bar-Jesus was ready to oppose the gospel preached, for he recognized a formidable foe in Saul. Remember, Saul, trained rabbi, educated Jew equally at home in Roman law, Greek philosophy, Jewish religion, and the scriptures. And as he was soon to discover, Saul was one who knew, knew the true Jesus. Opposition to the gospel 
here in Cyprus quickly centered on this man, Bar-Jesus. That is usually the pattern. Some religious man, not of God. If it is not the shaman, the witch doctor, the local holy man, it is the local priest or reverend who is not filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Saul, who is also called Paul. From this point forward, Saul is called Paul. In those days, nearly all Jews, they had two different names. One was a Jewish name by which they were known in their own Jewish circle, The other, a Greek name by which they were known to the wider world. Sometimes the Greek name translated the Hebrew, such as Cephas is the Hebrew, and Peter the Greek for the word rock. Thomas is the Hebrew, and Didymus the Greek for twin. Sometimes it echoed the sound. Eliakim in Hebrew became or becomes Alchemist in Greek. Joshua becomes Jesus. So Saul was also Paul. Scripture here does not tell us what this sorcerer bar Jesus said to oppose Saul or Paul and Barnabas. But I'm sure that he denied the gospel of Jesus and he attacked the actual person of Christ. (coughs) He used all of his bag of tricks with which anyone is familiar with familiar with who has tried to speak to someone about Christ in the presence of someone who is involved in a cult, be it a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon. The usual twisting of truth and distortion of facts. All the usual. Playing upon doubt, uncertainty, fear. See, It was clearly a time now for the Holy Spirit to act in power. (coughs) So Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he deals effectively with this sorcerer. (coughs) Oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, (laughs) you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? Paul, he looked intently at this Servant of Satan. Their eyes meeting. And then Paul just rips into them. Speaks truth. The spirit of truth blazed out in a flash of light and heat in this first confrontation with satanic delusion. I want you to understand that Paul was not interested in making friends with Bar-Jesus. No. Paul was interested in saving the soul of Sergius Paulus, the proconsul. Bar-Jesus, he was an apostate. He had made his decision. He'd rejected God, and he was now serving his master. But Paul was going to show him the true master, the true Lord, Jesus. Verse 11. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Suddenly the Holy Spirit strikes. Saul's temporary blindness had led him to spiritual renewal. So perhaps the same would happen to this sorcerer. Excuse me. The Spirit of God loves even those 
that he smites. This confrontation, it was inevitable. And it was a sharp and decisive storm. But it left the air clear and the sky sunny. And the governor, he was awed. And the false prophet, groping for help. Or Jesus, he was trapped in a physical darkness. Just as he was trapped in a spiritual darkness. When we reject truth, when you reject light, what is left is counterfeit and darkness. Satan, the enemy, will try to blind us in and through unbelief, causing us to stumble around in the world seeking someone to help us, while all along the answer is next to us. The answer is in the midst of us. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, it reads, The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with His love. He will rejoice over you with singing. What a beautiful Verse, the mighty one will save. <coughs> Jesus and salvation is only a prayer away. Verse 12, then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The word for astonish, it is in the strong tense. It means to strike out or expel by blow. It literally means to be struck with astonishment. The governor, he was violently shaken out of his complacency. And it was the word of God that did it. That was the miracle. And he believed. The word believed means to believe absolutely, to trust fully, completely. We like to think of ourselves as intelligent human beings (laughs) and that we seek out the truth and that we will recognize the truth when we see and hear it. Sergius, he was an intelligent man, and he sought out Paul. He sought out the truth. And he listened to Paul. He listened with open ears and an open heart. And he heard the word of God. He heard the word of God. And he saw the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit drew him into God. And he fully, completely, absolutely believed. (laughs) He believed in the light of Jesus. And he gained eternal salvation, his sins eternally cleansed. Bar Jesus, because of his unbelief, he went into darkness. Paul, empowered by the Holy Spirit, made Bar Jesus go blind. See, Or Jesus, he thought himself intelligent, street smart, savvy. And he made his decision. He rejected God. And not only rejected God, he withstood, if you remember, Scripture says, he withstood against God, against the gospel. He opposed the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't believe in Jesus. Thought his sorcery and magic tricks stronger. He was not ignorant, but foolish. Ignorant, again, is being unaware, unknowing. Being a Jew, Bar-Jesus knew about God. Foolish is knowing, but still making it an unwise decision. And though God is patient to those who oppose him, there comes a time when that will end. 
King Solomon, the wisest man to ever walk the face of the earth besides Jesus. He said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14, For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. All will come out in the light, good and bad. Today, if you were sitting in here, if you were listening or watching, you cannot claim ignorance. You've heard the gospel. And if you were sleeping during that minute, let me give it to you again. <laughs> to see the kingdom of heaven, to have eternal salvation, all that it takes is believing in the name of Jesus, believing that he died on the cross for your sin, and that they buried him in the grave, but the grave couldn't hold him. And he arose, and now he's at the right hand of God. That if you believe in the name of Jesus, you will not go to hell. You will not go to damnation. You will be heavenly royalty up in heaven. That is the gospel. There is only one way to see the kingdom of heaven, to have eternal salvation. That is through the blood of Jesus on the cross. I don't care what other people, other churches, other whatever they say. This is what I believe in. This is truth. Everything else is counterfeit. Amen. That is the gospel. So you cannot claim ignorance. You have heard the gospel. So the question that I have for you here, watching, listening, are you foolish this morning? Or are you wise? Will you reject Jesus or will you accept Jesus? In a moment, we are going to partake of communion. Communion is where we recognize the goodness of God the Father and the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, that he died for our sins, and he is the light of the world. Communion is only for those who believe. If you are not a believer in Jesus, please do not partake. It is only for those who believe in the name of Jesus and then also those who are living a repentant life. Communion is a time to reflect Reflect on our hearts to see if there's any sin, anything in there that would keep us from fellowship with God. If you had a blow with your husband or wife before you came or last night and it hasn't been settled, you need to get that straight. If you have been gossiping and you know that, you need to get that straight. If you've been lying, stealing, whatever. See, what is important, not that you take away any of my words, but that you hear from God and that you get this vertical relationship right with God. Because if we get that vertical relationship right with God, all of these horizontal relationships of people, they'll all fall into place. What is important is the vertical relationship, you and God. Communion is a time for us to check our hearts. And if there is anything that needs to be dealt with. That you deal with it. You can come up here. I'll pray with you. We'll get it right. Get you right before you partake or leave. Here at Calvary Chapel, with the elements, we have two cups. We have bread on the bottom and then juice on top. After the song for those who believe in the name of Jesus, who believe that Jesus died for their sins, and who are living a repentant life. We as a family will partake together. This is my family, believers. We are all family together. Yes, we do have crazy uncles and at times, <laughs> but we love each other, and we work with each other. So please hold on to the elements till after the song. Maestro. I love the words 
of that song. We're all sinners. But for those who give their life to Christ, you're redeemed. Heaven is not for the flawless, but the forgiven. I'm so thankful for that. <laughs> In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, reads, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death till he comes again. Come quickly. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we just thank you for how good you are, for how holy majestic and righteous. We thank you that you sent your son, Jesus, and Jesus, just a shout out, thank you that you willingly came. You left your throne and you came down here and you lived as us and you died a horrible, excruciating death. You died so that we could live. You took the penalty that was due for our sin. You took it upon your shoulders and you also took the wrath your father to deal, to pay for that sin. You died for us so that we could live eternally for those who believe in you. I pray that we never forget your sacrifice and what you've done for us how much you love us. We thank you. In your name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please partake. I pray that God goes with you today. I pray that through his Holy Spirit, he continues to speak to you, that he continues to guide you, to encourage, to comfort, and when needed, convict. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I highly recommend that you come forward. Myself or one of the other pastors will pray for you. You see, for tomorrow is never guaranteed. Scripture says today is the day of salvation. Nobody knows what will happen when we leave, when we turn off the radio, when we shut down our computer. No one is guaranteed tomorrow. And if you don't deal with your sin while you are alive here on earth, it will be dealt with in the afterlife. And if you've not given your life to Jesus, then... It is not a pleasant thought. I do not wish that on my worst enemy. If you would like prayer for any reason, please come forward. Do not leave without doing business with God. May God bless you.